everybody. Welcome to Seattle Revit Users Group. Obviously, I'm not David Diarza. He was uh, called away, and so I'm taking over as the vice president here. And so I'm going to share my screen, and we're going to get to the slides right now. And we'll get started here, because this is going to be really super interesting for everybody. I'm hoping, anyway. <laughs> I know, anyway. So um, here we have Seattle Revit Users Group, and it's August 29th. Can you August 19th, not 29th. Can you believe it's the 19th already? So moving forward, this is going to be a great presentation. In all full disclosure, the uh, okay. Now we're having problems here. There we go. Um, McDonald Miller has used the Wild, so Gabe is going to come out here. He's the founder and CEO of the Wild. This is going to be something like you've not seen before. So it's really going to be uh, a great presentation when we get into Revit to VR, the collaboration from anywhere. This isn't like something you have to be working together. You guys can be anywhere in an augmented and a virtual reality. This will allow your teams to ideate, to review, to share, and present in cross-platform XR in the same war, same room or anywhere in the world. So I'm really hoping you guys enjoy this. He's worked for such companies as Google, Samsung, Nike, AT&T, Verizon, and my favorite, McDonald Miller. So um, let's move forward here. We like to thank our vendor partners. As you see here, these are the, the companies that make this possible. This is an atypical um, presentation that we've been giving um, over the last few months. We are very thankful that you are here to see this and you're joining us. So we really want to make this of high value too. And we really thank our vendor partners for making that possible with these high value presentations they've been giving. We also want to thank the board members, even though we don't see each other, we still do talk with each other. We still do need to communicate with each other. Um, and uh, um, we'd like to thank them for all their hard work that they do. If you'd like to become a member, you notice we do have two openings here. Reach out to one of us. It'll be fine um, if you want to help on the board. Also, please go to our YouTube channel. So the YouTube channel and subscribe to this. Um, you get access to all of the videos, and you can go back and you can check them. You can share them with maybe some of the thought leaders um, or senior leadership in your company um, to help implement some of these into your environment. David also wanted to put this in here. Uh, Selen is looking for a virtual design and construction integrator. You'll be working with the VDC lead. You'll be using BIM. Um, obviously, uh, you get to work on some cool projects, um, according to what David says. <laughs> Um, and you will be working on cold projects. Um, this market is a great market for those type of things. So contact David if you're uh, if you're interested in this. So we'd like to give a huge thank you to the Wild um, for giving this presentation. So I'm going to give the share back the screen sharing back, and we can get moving on with this presentation. All right, terrific. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to kick this off. I want to I want to thank Lena and Sira for letting us present today. Um, this is super exciting. I'm going to dive right into it and get started here. Oh, maybe am I going to switch over? Okay, so we're going to start today with an exploration of immersive collaboration. What is it and why is it important? Then we're going to dive right into Revit and we're going to look at that transition of taking your content from Revit and bringing it into virtual reality. Then uh, we'll look at inviting collaborators to that content, having them join you from anywhere across the world, uh, optimizing your content so that it performs well across all of these devices in augmented and virtual reality exploring BIM data inside of these spaces. And then last, we'll look at augmented reality, the use case for really uh, spanning that divide between the physical world and the virtual content, and um, show a, a couple use cases on how you can incorporate augmented reality into your workflow. So I'll take 15 minutes at the end for Q&A, and I urge you during this portion, and, and all while I'm talking, go ahead and please post your questions uh, down right at the bottom of the screen there, you see a Q&A button. Go ahead and ask your questions as I'm talking along, and then I'll do a rapid fire at the end of uh, to answer all of your questions. And the last thing is the chat window over on the side there. Please feel free to chat it up. Um, we have a few people from the wild who can answer some questions on there as well, and have some fun while I'm talking and, and moving through these different topics. All right, so let's kick this off with a little exploration of reality soup. So 
virtual reality, mixed reality, augmented reality, uh, extended reality, all of these different words that honestly, even for us in the industry can be quite confusing at times. And I'm not really gonna take today to get into a definition of all of these different things um, because I think you you can easily lose yourself in um, in the details here while while losing a bigger picture that is honestly more important, especially for right now. And that bigger picture is immersive. So it's the idea of not going to a device to explore digital content, to do your work, to communicate with other people, but rather having that just live um, amongst you, around you, being truly immersive in that experience. And this is a major shift for us because we spend such a huge portion of our time right now sitting at desks. It's been so normalized that that is how humans exist on this planet, sitting at desks, staring at screens, just like I'm doing right now, um, looking down at our phones, hunched over. But really, we can do better than that. We can live, we can have technology living in our world rather than us going to technology and living in its world. And, um, and to do that, we really have to make this shift from, from how we interact with this digital content um, on all of these screens to just existing in and around us. And immersive computing and all of these different forms of it, so virtual reality, mixed reality, uh, augmented reality, all have different angles at that. And they all deal with different levels of immersion um, and different levels of uh, how connected to, you, the, to your physical world you are. So are we, um, are we completely virtualized into a virtual reality or are we more connected into the physical, um, the physical space that we're inside of and augmenting that with, our, with virtual content through augmented reality? All of these things are super important, but we really need to start with a look at how far we've come. So virtual reality now has been around for many years now. And the promise of virtual reality has been around for much longer than that. Uh, the ideas of what virtual reality could, could accomplish in the world have existed in sci-fi for generations. And because of that, because there's been so much buildup, so much anticipation for this technology, we got to it. And a lot of people had this, this initial experience was, wow, this is super cool. And it has that, 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 it, that it's such a different experience putting that headset on and exploring digital content in this new way that it has this allure of being really neat, very innovative, very captivating. And yet I don't think that's enough. And I think that that's a lot of the disillusionment, disillusionment with virtual reality and augmented reality that's happened over the past two years has been because the coolness of it has not yet caught up to the usefulness of it. And, or swap that, reverse it. The usefulness of it has not yet caught up to the coolness of it. And yet I would say this is super important for us to do. We need to find a way to make it just as useful, I would say even more useful than it is cool to really incorporate this technology as, as a fundamental part of our everyday lives. And to do that, you know, through all of my exploration, I had to really focus down on what I felt like the real value of this technology is for right now, where it is right now. The headsets are still a little bit big. Um, it's awkward to hold tablets in front of you in front of you um, in this position that you need to for augmented reality. And so you better be creating some value on the other side of that that is not possible in any other way. And that's really how I came to focus on collaboration as a prime problem to solve with this technology. And so let's look at collaboration as, as it exists today. The gold standard for collaboration is this in a conference room, the whole team brought together in person, staring each other in the face, laying out all of your materials, all of your different devices. Maybe you have a big screen at one side that you're sharing, um, you know, the digital model, but you've got all of the drawings, you've got materials all laid out across the table, right? This is great, but it's also incredibly problematic for a number of reasons. One of them is super obvious and we're all seeing experiencing now is that in this time of COVID, our, our ability to be 
physically cohabitating a space is compromised. And so now we see the liability of that. We need to find a better way to collaborate at this same level remotely from anywhere in the world. But another one is even beyond that. Um, our ability to transport ourselves into that place and have this experience also comes at an enormous cost. There's a time cost that we spend getting everyone to these spaces. There's a, um, there's a cost for the space itself to create it, to maintain it, to make it a, a well-oiled machine so that we can have a high, uh, a, a great experience collaborating inside of it. And, and so that's where I realized back before I founded The Wild in um, 2017 that the real revolution that I wanted to be a part of is not solely the revolution of collaboration. It's to solve a problem that's even slight, big, slightly bigger than collaboration. And to me, that problem is transportation. This ability, how do we transport everyone into a shared space in a way that they have complete agency over it, they can experience each other's ideas at first hand, and in a way that is not possible um, via normal, you know, uh, non-technical methods. And so I wanted to look at three aspects of transportation and see how we can do better through immersive. And the first one is the transportation of people. Taking people from wherever they are across the world and cohabitating them inside of an experience instantly. So not, you know, this is not an incrementally better jet or plane or spaceship or car. Um, this is not an electric vehicle. This is instant transportation across the world via virtualization of people. The second one is the transportation of places. And this is very specific to the AEC industry. It's not just a matter of taking these people into a shared you know, conference room. You need a, a way to transport the places to you so that you can experience them uh, from wherever you are. And, and that's whether those places are, are physical places like um, you know, a lot in New York City or whether they're virtual places like a building that hasn't even been constructed yet. And that's really what leads us to the third and critical piece of this, something that we can do better inside of these immersive technologies than anywhere else, and that is the transportation of ideas. How do we connect these people, the places, and all of these ideas into a shared experience so that we're shortening that distance between an idea and a shared experience. Something that is incredibly hard. You think of all the ways that right now, if you have an, an idea, especially something that's difficult to describe or visualize for another person, the distance between that idea inside of your head and, and that team of people inside of the room is actually quite vast. Um, you can sketch that idea. You can try to describe it. You can, you know, do charades to try to describe it. But all of these abstractions don't really get to that that core shared experience that you want, so that you can experience that idea at an equal level between everyone inside of the space. And so. I initially founded The Wild, like I said, in 2017 to really combat this. And so we built The Wild as an immersive collaboration platform for teams to experience their work together from anywhere in the world in augmented and virtual reality. And to show you a little bit of this today, and, and not just The Wild, I'm trying to just really focus on um, these bigger concepts at play. So how, how we can use immersive to, um, to work together. We're going to start with a case study of um, a socially distanced workplace. Uh, something that a lot of you, I'm sure, are working on right now, and that is how do we retrofit these commercial office spaces um, to be socially distanced and, and take people back into a shared office space, but in a way that is safe and, um, and still effective. And so to do that, we are gonna transport ourselves right over here to a familiar place, and that is Revit. So Interior Architects, one of our customers was kind enough to share this model with us. Um, this is one of their office spaces that they use um, or that they've designed and we're gonna use today to show some of these concepts. Um, so thank you to Interior Architects and, um, and Kat over there especially for, for working with us and sharing this with us today. Okay, so let's start 
by keeping it super simple and just look at what it takes to get this, this 3D view into the wild. And I'm going to start here at the wild plugin. So, or the wild add-in, sorry. So in the add-ins tab, you've got um, an option for the wild here. I can go um, click on that and I get our, our add-in dialog here. Um, I'm able to select a 3D view, any 3D view from this Revit model, and um, I can click on Create Space. Then basically I can choose the team that I want to connect this to. I'm just going to go ahead and do this inside of the Wild team. I am going to choose our project um, inside of the Wild that was built for this webinar, and I'm not going to change the space name for now. And go ahead and Create Space. So what happens when you click this button is we're uh, taking all the data inside of this 3D view. We're crunching it down, optimizing it, and then transporting it up into our um, uh, cloud inside of the wild so that it can be shared with everyone. There's a lot of, of content or stuff happening behind the scenes. But really, you know, for even a space of this this size, it doesn't take long. And, and I'll say also for um, the initial space, the initial time you bring in a space like this, it's going to take longer than updates that I'll show you in the future or in, in a little bit here. So once this is finished. Yeah. OK, so the space pops right open and then streams its content in and you'll see that right away in desktop mode, I can move myself around this space. So I don't have a VR headset on. Um, I'm just exploring this on a regular Windows computer. And um, I can change my point of view and move around this space here inside of workshop shop mode, um, what we call workshop mode, viewing this as a scale model. And this is a great way, honestly, just to explore you know, the Revit 3D views are so difficult to explore in and of themselves that just getting a nice 3D view into this content um, really helps uh, that you can navigate out very fluidly like you see here. Now, uh, you can move around with a mouse and keyboard. Um, I'll show you what that looks like so that I can just drag my point of view around here with a mouse. I'm using a, a gamepad here to um, move around fluidly. And we really recommend this as a workflow for giving presentations. Uh, just because it's nice to give like a sort of polished fly through visual um, to something that you're doing live and exploring and moving around. But I don't just want to explore this content alone. Um, I want to come back up here and share this with my collaborators. So how do I invite them? Well, the first thing I want to show you is uh, the 2D interface of the wild here. That um, you have teams on the left over here, and then you have. Um, you have projects within each of those teams. And then within each project, you have spaces, um, collections of, of assets. And all of this content management side, um, I'll, you can manage here in the 2D interface and then leverage inside of the space itself. Um, so this is that Revit model that I brought in. But you can also bring in Revit families um, as individual objects to, to then leverage inside of the wild. So let's share this with our collaborators. That's right. That's what I was going to do. So let's start here. Um, I'm going to type in Misha. And I'm also going to invite Austin. Um, I'm going to give them edit permission. Uh, view permission is great for clients uh, who you don't want to mess up the space or move things around. They can uh, view, the, view and comment inside of the space, but do nothing else. Meet me for the demo. OK, great. So I'm going to go ahead and share that off. And they will join us here inside of the space. So let's just give them a minute to show up. Oh, great. Hi, Austin. Hey, Gabe. How's and it going? Good. And we've got Misha here as well. So can you guys hey, tell everybody. us? Hi. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what devices you're on and where you are physically located? So I am in Salem, Oregon, in my home office, as I'm sure many of you are as well. And I'm joining from an HTC Vive Pro, and that is connected to my uh, workstation at home. And I'm working out of Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm currently on a Rift S, and I'm tethered to a Razer Blade 15 laptop. Great. So we can all see each other. We can talk to each other. Um, even though I'm in desktop mode, I just appear as another avatar inside of the space to them. 
and maybe this is actually a good point to talk about the avatars. So um, we're often asked how, how much you can configure them. Uh, you can choose your colors, uh, a color for the top, a color for the bottom, and of course you can change your name. But we really like the avatars to sort of melt away and not be distracting, not be too uh, creepy, honestly, by trying to be too photorealistic. That's why our avatars are slatted. Um, we like to put the emphasis on the content itself, which in this case is your Revit model. So you'll see here that Misha can teleport himself down into the space. Um, Austin can go down into the space as well. Now they are little miniatures down there in one-to-one -one mode. Um, they can also scale themselves anywhere in between. We can also bring ourselves down here and teleport into the space, and then we're at one-to-one -one mode. Um, this scale manipulation inside of the wild can be a little bit uh, to, uh, much to wrap your mind around. The important thing to keep in mind is that we're not changing the scale of the space itself. Whatever scale you designed this in inside of Revit is the space that it exists, or the scale that it exists inside of, and the and the units will match if, if we measure anything within here. Uh, we're just manipulating ourselves inside of the space so that when you're super large, you can do very large things like move an entire pod of furniture around or, um, you know, move walls around or, or the ceiling. But exactly or you can um, make yourself very small and move individual objects around inside of the space. Uh, but go ahead, guys, can you show us, and, and actually even Misha shows that you can go below one-to-one -one scale <laughs> to make yourself very small um, to do precision type work, or even crawl inside of a duct or inside of a wall to explore what's on the other side of that. But go ahead, what are, what are we gonna show them today in terms of this workflow for creating a social distanced uh, workspace? Yeah, well, as you said, designing for social distancing, that's hot on everyone's minds right now. And it's one thing to be actually designing in Revit, just looking at an overview with six feet apart. But what we really like about being in virtual reality is that it allows us to quickly ideate and move things around at human scale. And oftentimes, that's where we're placing and realizing sometimes some of the hidden space that we wouldn't otherwise overlook. Sometimes we need to make other decisions for that. So Misha and I are actually going to import some assets here and just kind of look like, see see what it looks like to move some of this stuff around for our six foot radius here. So we've got a little circle um, for our six foot. And if we were to maybe, let's see, import a video of someone just standing just to get an idea of what that scale looks like. Very quickly, we can start to see how the space is laid out. So we're just going to... So a couple questions yeah, here. Put some um, masks over here. First of all, can you describe how, um, like, how did you, 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 clearly we just watched you move some content around that was from Revit. Um, so maybe describe how, how we do that. How do we actually manipulate the content that is already inside of the Revit model? Maybe Misha, do you want to so, take that? Um, Yes, sure. So we, we have the ability through our, our Revit add-in to designate any Revit family as movable in the wild. So you have the ability to say, I want to move furniture, I want to move uh, walls, I want to move specialty equipment. And then when you import uh, uh, that space or create a space from your Revit file in the wild, um, th those objects will be individually uh, movable or addressable. So you can, you know, in this case, we uh, designated these objects as movable and then that means that we can delete them, move them. We could take them, save them to our library to use them in a different context and, and basically ideate with um, with those objects. So that's how that works. And yeah, again, actually, designate a family. Yeah, let me that's let me cool. take this moment to go ahead and switch over here to show them. Um, so this is actually on our, our help docs. Um, but it just a uh, quick way to show you where you, you find that inside of Revit in the project parameters. And um, and then you basically add a pro project parameter um, called the wild movable and um, set that to a text and then a type of text. And then you can specify the, um, the categories that you want included in that. So what do you want to be able to manipulate? Is it just uh, furniture, which comes by default with Revit? Or do you want to be able to manipulate the walls or curtain panels or columns or whatever whatever else you want to select from, the, from this checkbox here? Uh, once that is selected, 
if you bring that content into virtual reality, into the wild from Revit, then it is manipul or movable, just like you're seeing them move this content around right now. Okay, um, then maybe talk a little bit about um, like these additional pods and, and even the, the distances that you're marking here. How did you guys do that? So we just we just uh, measured out uh, a six foot diameter. Um, we have a native modeling tool or architectural sketching tool, if you will, with a massive tool. We can display dimensions here on this. We measured out six feet. Um, uh, we have also some snapping options. So see here right now it's free form, but we can also snap this to uh, foot or half foot increments. And then using our other tools like the sketch tool to quickly uh, sketch out some elements and actually how I did that is I made one element copied it with our array tool so the, the tools we're offering in the wild are really meant to be used creatively and um, you know just how you would have a, ver a, a real life work space where you use post-it notes you know the tools available to you to um, you know to communicate your ideas and that's what we're doing right right now um, and you know quickly sketching out this six foot diameter without having to, you know, model it or um, import it from anywhere. We can do these things on the fly. And then again, grouping it, grouping it up, I could combine it with, um, you know, any, any kind of, let me grab this chair over here um, and, you know, group these together. I could save that to my library. So that's basically how we created these other elements and then just work with this. Uh, I could save it to my library so I can just drop it into my virtual library and, and give it a name. And maybe Misha, can you show us how to take things out of the library? Or, or even, let's just see what the library is inside of the well. Sure, so I can just open up um, my library and this is the equivalent of what we've seen earlier uh, in our content management where we, where we manage our content and all the models or assets we import will show up here. So we have assets, spaces. Uh, you can see some of the spaces we're in right now collections of, of assets, some of which we've um, pulled out just a second ago. So you can browse here and just grab and pull those out. And you can see these assets load. I can load in as many as I want, but I can also um, save assets. So if I'm in this collection here, I can grab this chair I just made and just drop it in here and give it a name, say chair. There you go. And then now this asset lives in my library, library and I can pull it out in any context. So it could go in a different space and, and pull uh, this, this same piece of content out and work with it. Um, how about uh, once you get that content out, maybe show how you use the grab tool to, um, to move it around and, and snap it onto different surfaces? Sure, so sure. I can uh, go to my tools here and select the grab tool. Um, and then uh, we have a snap functionality. So you can see if I move it towards a surface here, this desk here, it will, will snap onto, uh, onto that surface. And I can It'll also here then here. lock it. So if I don't want other, people's to move it around, other people to move it around, I can lock that content. And as you will see, this works with uh, any kind of surface. So let me, for demonstration purposes, I need to turn off our keep upright, I can come back in here and then, you know, if I wanted to move this desk onto the wall, which <laughs> doesn't make much sense, but you can see how it snaps to, to any surface uh, I want it to snap to. There you go. Yeah, so it's this sort of uh, free form manipulation of that content that allows you to really experiment with it and um, put it in different places and um, uh, really ideate free form. Um, now the benefit of, of working this way is is that we have this ability to um, experience it live. So I can come up here and I can sit inside of this desk. And can one of you go walk along that green line um, so we get a feeling of sure. how close it's going to be, you know, what it's going to feel like to be there. And this is one thing to do here inside of um, uh, inside of a desktop mode. But to be in a headset and to experience that is just a different level of immersion, of that feeling of, of really being there. Um, maybe, can you guys show us how quick, uh, how we could even toggle on and off the sketches to get an idea? Once we get a layout that we like, um, go ahead and hide the sketches.
for us? Yeah, sure thing. So we have this visibility tool over here. I'll Oops. get you a view Sorry. of that. And we have a bunch of layers for all the different components that are in here, but particularly with sketches, it's really easy to just turn off very quickly. And if we need to see it again, it's just a little trigger touch. So with the sketches off, we get an idea for what this space is going to look like. OK, great. So everyone come over here, and let's go explore a different kind of model. Um, I'm going to switch over into Revit, and we have over here this MEP building. Now, I've already imported this building in um, into a space, and I want to show you what it would look like to access that Revit model um, from and explore it right from inside of the wild. So Misha, can you bring up your library and show us what it's like to navigate to a new space? Sure. So again, I'm opening my library, and I can uh, um, filter for spaces here. And it looks like this is the space we want to go to. Again, pull it out, and it shows up as a portal. And I can uh, just go, go to this space by pulling this over my head. And you can see I'm already in the other space, but I can also bring you along. And now we're all uh, in this new space. And as you can see, the content is loading here. Terrific. And so portaling into this new space, now we have access to it. Again, it's still connected to that model directly from Revit. Um, now, what do we want to look at in this in this space? So let me actually um, use the visibility tool to turn off some of those walls, floors. Oop, come on. And to just to get a better view of some of the mechanical systems in here. And um, as you can see, that's visible now. So how about we go in here in the center area? And I'm using the people tool to bring all of you to me which is uh, another one of our tools that helps you gather people around you. I'm just hitting the gather button, and now everybody is uh, okay. gathering around me. And we can you know, inspect some of these elements here. And here's where the BIM tools come in handy. So let me uh, pull up my, um, you already saw, seen me use the visibility tool, where I can toggle visibility of families. But I can also use the inspect tool to query BIM data directly from any of these elements. So I can point my controller at this duct work here, um, and you can see I can uh, query all the information there, uh, the area. Let's see, a lot of this I don't understand, but I'm sure some of you will. <laughs> uh, and it's very useful information uh, to have handy in this immersive environment. Terrific, yeah. So you get access to all of that BIM data directly inside of the wild. Um, you can explore it. What if we? Um, what if we wanted to just view a section of, of this entire space? Um, to show you that, I uh, we've gone ahead and created another um, another three D view within this uh, for this MEP building, just of the typical room, and this is you know honestly just a simple uh, a simple section box on on the space. So you know you can manipulate this and change this just like any other um, to create uh, the 3D view. And then once you have this section view locked down exactly what you want to divide, um, what you want to preview, then you can come over and go into it. So can you take us into that typical room um, that we already brought in to, to show what that looks like? Sure. Let's hop on over. Great. So you can see that streamed right in. We have a very simple space here. Um, and here, I'd like to show you a little bit about what it's like to iterate back and forth from Revit to the wild. So um, here inside of the wild, we can we can look around this space, you know, explore it, um, look at this um, uh, ductwork up here, um, maybe take some measurements. Yeah, show us how the measure tool works. Sure. So this is uh, another one of our BIM tools. Just going to select measure. We have a couple different options here: uh, a perpendicular mode, uh, snap to surface. So the perpendicular mode is what I just showed you. So you can uh, query heights. Uh, then there is an automatic mode, which basically just casts, um, you know, a measurement uh, perpendicular to the surface uh, you are targeting. Uh, so this is very uh, useful to very quickly put in measurements. And again, all these measurements persist. So if somebody else comes in here, they can see 
uh, these measurements here in place. And if I would want to delete one, I just go up and toss it away or use my undo button to uh, undo the, um, the measurement. And then the last option is the free form, where it allows you to just go from any point uh, to any other point in the space. And obviously, we have metric and imperial units for you to choose. Great. Um, but let's say we take some measurements and we realize that this ductwork is a little bit off. How can we change that um, and iterate on it live within, in, with back and forth from Revit to the wild? OK, so switching back over here into Revit, um, I can go to a simple overhead view of this. Go ahead and select this content. And let's move it a bit. Well, maybe a little bit more than that. <laughs> Ugh. So we're going to select it again. And let's move it way over here. OK, great. This is, you wouldn't actually do that, but you get the point. All right, so going over here to add-ins, we can go back to view in the wild. And the beauty here is because this space was already imported in, similar to what I showed you um, in that first space, now you have the ability to update this space uh, rather than just import it. So I can hit this update button right here that in real time uh, goes through this process of updating the space. And so right away we come back into here and you can see that that ductwork has now moved and uh, moved across the room just like I had it inside of Revit. So this is a great example of how you can iterate, not, not just inside of the wild like we were showing you inside of that first space, but you can iterate directly from Revit to virtual reality um, with your team spread across the world. And so you know they can create notes inside of here. You can go move into Revit to execute on, on some of that feedback and then uh, update it live inside of the space. C can you guys show, uh, Austin, can you go ahead and show us um, yeah. a, a few different ways to leave notes inside of the wild? Sure thing. As you can see already, we're leaving some sketches here. It's just quickly what we approve or disapprove of and Misha's marking over there, how that's attaching to the wall. One of our other favorite tools is this comment tool and it allows you to use speech to text to asynchronously leave your comments. So I could come up here and say, this looks much better. And it looks like it caught my first part there. <laughs> but you can place these wherever you want and just leave it. And these comments will then be either exported to PDF or you can take an image of the place. And then that just gives you a good idea of what kind of changes were made on the spot or what else needs to change. And I think this this idea of speech to text is is a big part of immersive computing, not just in the wild, but moreover, like we're so accustomed to using keyboards as our primary form of in input that we don't just have to take that paradigm directly into um, immersive computing. Speech to test text is an excellent way to bring content really rapidly or text based content really rapidly into the space and to interpret what you want. So we also do this to search. Um, uh, inside of the library. Maybe, uh, Misha, can you show us how, how to search for a material inside of the library? So again, I'm just opening my library and I'm holding up my controller to my mouth, uh, pull the trigger and say, let's say, brick. And as you can see, within a split second, I have some of my brick materials that I can uh, uh, bring out and then work with here uh, in the wild. OK, guys, this was great. Let's go ahead and um, show everyone how to use augmented reality with the wild. So to do this, I'm going to go ahead and switch over to my phone. And basically, this is what it looks like. So to show you this better, I'm actually going to screen share my phone directly onto the screen. And so I'm going to switch over to that. Great. So you're just looking at my, my phone live on the screen right now. And let's go ahead and go into landscape mode. So this looks cleaner. And then jump down here to the kitchen table. OK, so we're going to start here just with this simple kitchen table. Unfortunately, the room that I'm inside of here doesn't have a lot of space. And so you're going to have to imagine what this is like to have a bigger uh, virtual space. But the first thing you see here is um, the room that I'm inside of. And 
you see these dots on the ground and it wants me to basically touch the floor surface. So touching on there says that this is the floor and here you can see that now I've got this virtual content inside of my physical room here. So we can see uh, Misha and Austin inside of this space. I can come over here and I have the ability to, to see them, to talk to them. And just like inside of our other platforms, um, they can move stuff around, they can comment inside of this space and we see it all happen live. Now, the beauty of augmented reality is that there's this connection from this virtual space into the physical space. So inside of a sort of a crude interior design demo like this, you can see how you could use this interface to take an interior directly from Revit, bring it into a space in the wild, and then you can see you can, um, you can connect this uh, Revit content directly inside of the physical room that I'm inside of. But there's actually more that you can do because it, you don't just have to do sort of a, a small space like this. It could be a very large space. So let's go navigate over here to, um, let's see, I think we were going to do this pink rabbit space. So this is an entire building. Um, that I'm going to go ahead and show you that we can actually scale it down and experience this entire building inside of augmented reality as well. It provides a really nice way for someone who doesn't want to get inside of a VR headset to still explore this content, either in scale mode like this or um, in one-to-one -one mode. If we uh, double tap, we get this at one-to-one -one mode, and now we're having sort of like a virtual reality type experience, but inside of augmented reality on my iPhone. <laughs> okay, so um, we covered a lot there, went through all of the different uh, types of uh, ways you can experience the wild. And I wanna make sure to reserve some time here to get to the questions. So if you if you have a question and haven't asked it yet, please go ahead and do that. Let me pull up my window here. Okay, looks like, yeah, we have some questions going and that there's been a fair amount of chat. Great. All right, so I'm just gonna dive in and start answering something. The first one I've got here, can anyone recommend an online Revit course that gives Autodesk educational content access? Um, so I could practice Revit at home. So uh, there's a ton of great content. Oh, and it looks like Darren Young actually already, oh, great, y you know what? You guys are answering these questions yourself. You don't even need me here, forget it. Okay, I'm gonna jump to another one that I'm more qualified to answer. So do objects placed while in VR now feed back into the Revit model? Great question. So um, objects that, uh, anything that you change inside of the wild, um, it stays in the wild. We want the wild to be sort of a clean sandbox where we're not, um, where you can ideate freely and not destroy what's happening back inside of your Revit model. So the, the general recommended workflow, like we showed in that first in, interior architect space, is to uh, uh, make some change, whatever changes you want inside of the wild, and then capture those changes with the, our camera tool, which I didn't show you. It allows you to take cameras inside of this, or uh, sorry, images inside of the space, or you can lay comments into the space to, to denote the changes you wanna make. And then you can export those all as one package in a PDF um, that then you can use to make those changes back in Revit. But at this point, the updates are all happening one way from Revit into the wild. So even if you push an update from Revit, so let's say you move a uh, desk and chairs around, then you push a new update from Revit, it's gonna move that desk and chairs back to where it was, uh, where you have it and have updated it in the Revit file so that you can get this clean iteration back and forth from Revit as your primary authoring tool, using the wild as your collaboration and ideation tool. Okay. So what else do we have here? Can you do more than just move static content like stretch and model that, um, like stretch a model that affects the content? Um, you can move, you can scale. I don't know if I'm totally understanding this, this question, but you can move content inside of the wild. You can 
you can scale it um, and you can drop it. Um, so stretch a model that affects the content. I'm not, I'm not sure what I mean by what, what you're asking by that, but those are the ways you can manipulate content uh, that you bring in externally, like uh, Revit families or um, uh, even content from Sketchfab or, or SketchUp Warehouse or all these online repositories for 3D materials. You can bring those in as assets, add them to your library, bring them out, and then um, uh, manipulate or move and scale that content inside of the wild. Anything that you model inside of the wild using our massing tool, you can uh, manipulate um, you know, the various aspects of the mass. You can group any content inside of the wild into a group that then can be utilized across spaces. Can you focus more on snaps? Oh, snapping. Or, uh, okay, great question. Um, I didn't show you this, but on the side of that tabletop in the workshop mode, there are these buttons that give you different snapping options. So Misha I had had um, mentioned this in, when he was when he was showing measuring out something at some point. But basically, you can create half foot foot increment snapping. Um, you can toggle your units there as well between metric and imperial. Um, you can also change rotational snapping. These are sort of crude level. Um, uh, grid snapping options to, to for for your use when creating content um, inside of the wild, but because again the purpose is to allow you to move quickly, not necessarily with a high degree of precision. We want you to do your precision tool work back in your authoring application, whether that's uh, Revit in this case, or 3D Studio, or, or SketchUp, or any other program um, that is is really focused on that authoring and documentation where precision is super important. Can changes to the brainstorming board be made while you are in the VR by anyone attending the meeting? Great question. Yes, um, this is you know one of the main advantages of utilizing um, a, a social workspace like the Wild uh, in, in in like an immersive playground like this is that anyone has access to manipulate content. You know, you think of what are the alternatives to to using a, an application like the Wild. Stuff that you guys, I'm sure, are doing today, where you're on maybe a Zoom conferencing call and one person is sharing Revit, and um, everyone is sort of instructing that person on what to do, what to change inside of inside of that file. Um, if if you are having like a live work session like that, but really you have to for people contributing just their ideas, um, the only way they have to describe them rather than showing them. And so one of the benefits of working inside of the wild is that anyone inside of the wild can um, hand something to the other person, move it around. There's no, um, there's no sort of separation between what I can do and what you can do. That being said, you can impose that separation by giving them view only access to content. Um, and this is specific to generally clients or people that you don't want to move content around. Uh, when you're logged in as a viewer, you still have access to explore that space. But um, if I was to hand you something, you then couldn't move it because you can't manipulate content inside of the space. You can only um, move around, move yourself around, uh, be presented to, and um, also leave comments inside of the space because that um, commenting flow is, is a primary way that people utilize that view only um, workflow is to give a client access to the space and they can go through and leave their comments inside of the space. Okay, please discuss registration UX between virtual and physical in AR. Oh, great question. Yeah, I sort of skimmed right over this. Um, I showed you a little bit in the beginning when uh, there was that grid pattern on the ground and I hit, um, I, I said where the where the um, the floor plane was. So what's happening in that moment is that um, you're specifying where the origin of the space is gonna be and how it aligns to the floor of the space. Um, then you have the ability to manually manipulate it. And you saw me dragging it around and, and even scaling the space. Um, so there, there's a mode where basically you can, um, you can register, man, you're manually registering the virtual space to the physical room that you're inside of. And um, that's the way you're, you're creating this registration right now between the virtual and physical. 
we do have thoughts and plans about improving that. Um, as we take our AR app out of beta, um, you're going to be seeing that stuff launch very soon. And um, I'm super excited about this. But honestly, there's a lot of usefulness just in, in terms of roughly registering the virtual and physical space together and then exploring it. Um, because once it's registered, then you can lock it in place and then you physically walk through it. So the workflow that I recommend right now is let's say you were going, you had a, more space and you were going outside to an empty lot. You would go out to that empty lot. You would bring up your iPhone, um, go into that space or, or your tablet. This is much better on like a giant iPad. Um, it's, it, it's really good to look at, especially if there are others with you. Uh, go to the center of the lot and drop the floor plane on, on the, you know, the foundation. Then uh, manually manipulate it. Uh, you know, you have to eyeball it until it's it's close and locked together and then lock it in place. And then you can physically walk the floor and, and literally, you know, walk outside the building and look at sight lines from the street, walk into the building and walk into a conference room and look all around. And, and then you're having this pseudo virtual reality experience um, where you're not necessarily seeing a lot of the surrounding world unless you're looking out a window, which is really awesome. You can look out a window and see what the sight line is from outside that window. Um, but that's what we're seeing happen today. Uh, and that's it, it's it's a really amazing way, especially for a client, to give them that literal feel of what it's going to be like to stand inside of this building before you've ever, you know, um, uh, built anything at all on, on top of this land physically. Okay, um, what else do we have here? Is there a connection with Vectorworks in development? Yeah. <laughs> so Vectorworks, you can bring content in uh, via FBX, I believe is the interchange we, we recommend from Vectorworks. Um, we have are in close contact with Vectorworks and have, have always talked about um, doing a direct integration with them. Um, and uh, you know, I really like what they're doing. And, you know, it's it, even asking that question here is one way that we get that feedback that that maybe uh, supporting the Vectorworks file natively, just like we do for Revit would be would be something beneficial. So uh, it's not in development currently, but it is something that we have explored and is definitely on our roadmap. Um, will the ability to comment and sketch ever be added to the desktop version? None of our clients have VR headsets and they often do walkthroughs of our spaces on their own and are unable to leave any form of comment. This is a, an excellent question and something that we know is a pain, pain point right now, um, especially you know during COVID as, uh, as headset availability has been compromised. Now they're coming back, but we know that adding this um, desktop interface is really beneficial. Um, so yes, the bottom line is the you can't do it currently, but yes, we I hear this and we have incorporated it into the very near term roadmap. You're going to you're going to be seeing um right now in development are a few things that not just commenting on desktop, but this whole desktop experience and finding ways to really effectively present to a group of people that are going to be joining from uh either Mac or Windows in 2D mode and have them have a, a good high quality experience like they're there um, is a big part of what we're focused on in, the, in this next stint. Um, so I'll be excited to share that with you. And, and I recommend, um, of course, go to our website. I'll, I'll give a little shout out to down below. There's a green button, the wild 15% off annual subscription. If you are interested in connecting with us about a plan, um, talking with our sales team, getting a, a personal demo, getting into a trial, please click that button and get in um, and share your feedback with us directly there as well. Uh, but that's also a great way to get on our on our mailing list so that you'll get notified when some of these, these new improvements launch. Oh my gosh, so many things. Okay, I'm going to go back up to the top. In AR, do others, Misha, Austin, et cetera, see the surrounding context, i.e. the room that Gabe is in? Great question. Um, so simply the answer is no currently that, um, Misha and Austin, what they were seeing is that totally virtual experience, just like we were seeing in the previous spaces, their, their experience of it is the content itself. Um, what they're seeing inside of the space. I am looking at the composite of the content with the physical room. Um, that being said, this is another area where, um, the, 
technology is advancing at a rapid pace. And you see now, especially some of you may be familiar with the new LiDAR iPad um, is really unlocking. So this is an iPad with a whole like advanced LiDAR sensor built into the new iPad. And it, it is enabling new functionality inside of software like the wild um, that could do exactly what you're talking about, which is a, a way for me in the augmented reality experience to, to live stream that, um, that physical content and virtualize it into the wild in real time. And so this is a core part of why we view the wild as an XR product, uh, extended reality. So really crossing the boundaries of augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, uh, you know, the reality soup because I love these workflows. It's, it's not just about creating a whole separate virtual reality. What we're doing is connecting people, places, and ideas. And in this case, uh, live streaming a place, a physical place into a virtual space so that others around the world can experience it in real time. You know, for this industry, that's a game changer. You know, it's, it's something that seems very sci-fi and you would it would be so helpful but it just didn't seem possible well guess what it's it's super possible and <laughs> we're working on that right now um it's just about to start about starting to blend your workflow into working immersively and you're going to have all of these benefits just keep coming as as the hardware gets more advanced like you're seeing right now with that ipad and even the virtual reality headsets, the all of the devices just advancing, and we incorporate that functionality into the virtual uh, into our software. Okay, sorry, I, I just talk and talk, but um, it looks like we still have some questions here, but we're right at our time um, to stop. And so I would just ask you guys to please um, uh, please connect with our team. On our website, there's a chat button right in the bottom corner and we will live answer these questions for you. We are always grateful to have those conversations. Whether or not you're interested in buying right now, please reach out to us, give us your feedback, ask some questions, connect with us. We, um, we love connecting with you and I'm gonna leave it at there for today. Thank you so much for, for your hour, an hour of your time today and I hope to see you all soon in the wild. Take care.